Dr. Gary Habermas, our guest today, has likely studied the historicity of the resurrection more than anyone alive. It's good that he's still alive, because according to Gary, you have to be alive to be relevant. The guys who believe in a single naturalistic theory are dying out. In his forthcoming book called On the Resurrection, Volume 2, Alternate Theories, his second of two volumes on the resurrection, he explains and responds to the leading alternate theories from the past to the present. Well, up until the advent of flip phones anyway. Whether believer or skeptic, I'd encourage you to read it. I will as soon as it arrives. But first, I have to get this video out. I'll be like 80 years old and rickety and won't even be able to sit in my, I won't even be able to sit in a chair for that long. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. And today, that's once again the father of the minimal facts argument for the resurrection, Dr. Gary Habermas, talking with Dr. Sean McDowell about the imminent release of the second volume of his four-volume magnum opus on the resurrection of Jesus. If you're a regular to the channel, you'll know I've been talking about Gary for years. Paul Lugia explains this. He's going to He's going to get it wrong. And you can catch up on all that in my Apologia versus Dr. Gary Habermas playlist. My Minimal Witnesses Hypothesis and Project is in direct response to Gary's Minimal Facts approach. So naturally, I'm very excited to hear everything I can about Gary's new book. Well, let's just jump right in. In your first volume, which I'm going to show here, because the cover for this one looks similar. So this is the first volume, 1,100 pages, your positive case for the resurrection. Uh, this book is coming out soon. As of the time of this recording, my copy has not yet shipped, but it should be getting here to Eastern Canada in about a week. Fingers crossed. I'd like to acknowledge up front that I'm responding to an off-the-cuff interview, and obviously the book is going to have the more extensive curated case and thoughts. Nevertheless, I think it's fair game to do commentary on how the book is being marketed to Christians. Volume 2, just give one example. I have three chapters on there on 19th century German liberalism. Uh, one is the one are the liberal theories, one are the liberals versus the liberals, and one is the conservatives at that time. I'm not going to be spending much time, either in this video, or likely when I crack open the spine on the book, reading multiple chapters about 19th century German liberalism, or any other hypothesis that scholars have abandoned for years or that I personally also reject, that aren't specifically relevant to my quest to know if Jesus really rose from the dead or not. Now, the first volume, I asked you to do the math, and you estimated like 32,000 hours. I didn't ask you ahead of time to run the math, but it take did it take you about as long as the first volume? More? Less? How would you assess just off the cuff? They're probably both comparable okay. as to how long, it, how long it took. That's about 11 years of eight-hour days for seven days a week for each volume. This makes me feel pretty good about my pace on my project. This this one is 900. So I think it's probably fair to say it's the longest treatment of naturalistic theories maybe ever, maybe of all time. I'm certainly not aware of one that comes close. I think this is less of an argument from page count than the first volume, because that was allegedly one big positive case. The brag on this one seems to be a sheer number of alternatives addressed. Hopefully the quality of refutation is there, and not just quantity. There are some crazy ones in this book. Uh, crazy because you never hear them, and odd because they're really silly. Like, uh, what if a UFO? Uh, what if Jesus was an alien? I mean, I guess those might be considered slightly more plausible than a miracle, but I'm not personally interested in anything that speculative or unsubstantiated. UFOs made the cut for the book. But do you know what probably didn't make the cut? My minimal witnesses hypothesis. Now, your book's focused distinctly on the scholarly literature. So you're not engaging YouTube videos. You're not engaging blogs or the internet, which is totally fine. You've got to focus. Ah, uh, yes. I see what you did there. Set the expectation with your viewers because you anticipate pushback about hypotheses like minimal witnesses, perhaps. That currently exists only on YouTube and well-cited blog articles. So by excluding YouTube and blogs, you can ignore it. It doesn't need to be critiqued. Or does it? 
Michael Goulder, a British biblical scholar who lived from 1927 to 2010, proposed a naturalistic explanation for the claims of Jesus' resurrection, focusing on psychological factors rather than supernatural events. His hypothesis suggests that grief-induced visions experienced by Jesus' disciples, particularly Peter, led to the belief in Jesus' resurrection. Goulder argued that these visionary experiences spread among the early Christian community due to emotional distress, cognitive dissonance, and cultural expectations. This theory emphasizes the role of psychological and sociological factors in shaping religious experiences, offering a non-supernatural interpretation of the resurrection claims while still affirming Jesus' historical existence. Sound familiar? Gerd Ludemann, a German New Testament scholar who lived from 1946 to 2021, proposed a naturalistic hypothesis to explain the claims of Jesus' resurrection. Ludemann suggested that the resurrection appearances reported in the New Testament were the result of visionary experiences, particularly psychological phenomena such as grief-induced hallucinations or altered states of consciousness experienced by Jesus' followers. According to Ludemann, these experiences were initially triggered by Peter, who was the first to have a vision of the risen Jesus. This vision, he argued, was a result of intense guilt and grief over Peter's denial of Jesus, leading to a psychological need to believe that Jesus had been vindicated by God. Peter's experience, in turn, influenced others, creating a chain reaction among the early disciples, who also began to have similar visionary experiences. Sound familiar? But Gary thinks these ideas are dismissible, because Goulder and Ludemann have passed. Garrett Ludemann and mm. John Shelby Spong mm. have both died in the last few years. Tell mm. me something. How many guys, well, I, I don't mean well-known debaters who are atheists and they're popularists and they're not, they're not New Testament scholars. So, not me. I'm dismissed a priori, which is fine. How many well-trained people in the field history, philosophy, but it's got to be they know the New Testament arguments. They know where things are. How many people today, how many can you name, who believe in a specific, one specific naturalistic theory? Mm. How about Stephen H. Smith with a PhD in biblical studies? He's published several relevant papers over the decades, culminating in this upcoming paper, currently in open peer review. It's titled, Exploring the Role of Bereavement Hallucinations in Early Christian Resurrection Beliefs. Here's just one quote among many I could have pulled. It is entirely possible that by means of this perfectly natural process, a bereavement hallucination experienced by Peter or another disciple was communicated to the others and developed into a fully-fledged delusion. Had the hallucination been of Peter's mother-in-law, nothing unusual would have happened. It would have required a hallucination of the risen Jesus, who the disciples believed to be, or suspected of being, the Messiah, in order to engender liftoff. Sound familiar? It's a great read, and currently free, so I'll have a link in the description. This is arriving too late for Gary's book but I'm pleased to see vindication from a scholar who should meet Gary's criteria for inclusion. Let's jump yep. about 1,700 years up to the Enlightenment with yep. Hume. You have an in-depth analysis of really who, who Hume was, his impact. So for starters, how significant was Hume? And how much does the shadow of Hume still loom today? And then I'm going to come back and look for some of your critique of it. Okay. Hume wrote, well, he died right about, right within days of the Americans signing the Declaration of Independence. So Hume, his life ends then. He writes his, his Of Miracles, which is not a standalone book. It's not even a standalone. It's part of his inquiry part of this big influential book inquiry, section 10 is this famous essay on miracles. And it's not very long. Depends on what edition you read it in, but it's not very long. Hume was very influential, very influential. And he still is pretty influential today. But to spill the beans a little bit, today the philosophers mostly, they're philosophers who go after professional philosophers who investigate Hume. Many of the philosophers are not theists. Um, well, a couple of the key ones are not theists. And the tendency today is to think Hume got it all wrong. Hume blew it. Hume got it all wrong, Gary? 
all wrong? David Hume's influence on modern philosophy is profound and far-reaching, spanning multiple areas, including epistemology, metaphysics, ethics, and philosophy of mind. His empiricism and skepticism have shaped contemporary thought, particularly his emphasis on experience as the primary source of knowledge and his challenges to rationalist views. Hume's work on causation, induction, personal identity, and moral philosophy continues to spark debate and inform current philosophical discussions. His arguments against religious dogma and miracles have contributed to the development of secular thought. While some of Hume's positions remain controversial, his ideas are widely taught and respected in philosophy departments worldwide. Modern philosophers generally regard Hume as a pivotal figure who marked the transition from rationalism to empiricism and scientific naturalism, cementing his place as one of the most significant thinkers in the Western philosophical tradition. This is the guy you say is all wrong on every topic on which he innovated and wrote? Or do you mean just on his short essay about miracles? Of course, theist scholars critique Hume's work on miracles. They have to. Christians like Richard Swinburne and Alvin Plantinga challenge his definition of miracles as violations of natural laws, arguing it's too rigid and fails to account for divine intervention within natural regularities. And I'm fine with that. I tend to be flexible on definition of miracle. Perhaps Gary is oversalivating over John Ehrman, a secular philosopher of science, who in 2000 wrote a piece provocatively titled Hume's Abject Failure. Ehrman contends that Hume's reasoning is fundamentally flawed and circular, as it presupposes the extreme improbability or impossibility of miracles from the outset. They tore into him, and they said, that's a circular definition. The work is not a defense of miracles themselves, but rather a critical examination of Hume's argumentative approach and methodology in addressing the topic. And guess what? I'm also fine with the circularity critique. I agree that to presuppose miracles don't happen means one can never conclude that a miracle occurred, even if one did. If the view goes that Hume was doing a circular definition followed by a circular argument, there are no resurrections because they don't occur. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, you really, you really solved that problem. In the end, non-theistic philosophers generally continue to find Hume's core skepticism about miracles to be persuasive. Even if they agree with some of Ehrman's technical criticisms, they argue that the general thrust of Hume's argument, that we should require extraordinary evidence for extraordinary claims, remains valid. But my embrace of Hume's philosophy isn't on the definition or frequency of miracles. It's with Hume's take on the ability of testimony alone to ever establish a miracle. You have, yes. I don't know, a 15, 20 point critique Give us maybe just two or three of the key critiques why you think Hume's rejection of miracles fails. Well, rather than, you, you tell me if this helps, but instead of a one, two, three, here's problems, let me go back to when that first essay was written, um, 1751. Sure. And when he wrote it, in those days, pastors, evangelical pastors, were not exactly like evangelical pastors today. These guys were very frequently theologians with a heavy dose of philosophy in their training. And I've got a book on my shelf. It's Critiques of Hume that started in the 1750s and mm. went through about 1780. And there's a few sporadically after. Hoxley's one of them. But there, there, were, there were critiques of Hume where these pastor philosophers went after him and they chewed him up. And a lot of people don't know this story, mm. that they chewed him up in the 1750s and 1760s so badly. This is hearsay. But Hume said something okay, supposedly said something in the presence of an eyewitness who wrote it down, not circumstantial. All right, say whatever you want. But he said, I was in the presence of Hume when he said, golly, Pastor so-and-so really whipped me. I mean, he whipped my <laughs> tail. And he makes this comment. I don't know if they were drinking a beer or if they were having a coffee. I don't know what they were doing. But in a pickup conversation, I picture being in a British pub uh, Hume was up in Edinburgh, could have been a Scottish pub. Um, he admitted that he was taken 
uh, taken apart. So Sean asked for two to three key critiques of where Hume's ideas fail, and Gary gives us no refutation whatsoever, but rather a sketchy sounding admittedly hearsay anecdote about a drunken Hume declaring defeat. Suppose today we found a verified authentic 1915 diary of someone who records going into a German pub in Berlin and having a chat with a drunken Albert Einstein, who is loudly declaring that his theory of general relativity was chewed up and taken apart. Would this cause a single scientist to stop finding relativity to be a useful tool of science? The idea lives and dies on arguments and evidence, not the fickle opinion of its popularizer. If, during this interview with Sean, Gary admitted that Polygia destroyed his minimal facts approach, to proving the resurrection, that would not actually be an argument against the minimal facts approach. This is just silly. Is this the kind of quality refutation that I can look forward to in the book, Gary? Let me just ask you, this is one that I hear commonly in my students in my resurrection class, we spend time interacting with this, is now that it's kind of shift towards the idea that history cannot evaluate miracles. But give us your response to the claim that history in principle cannot study miracles, so therefore any amount of evidence we offer for the resurrection isn't doing history. The kind you're talking about are a priori, let's take the legs out before we get to the body of the argument, and they're legit, because all they're saying is there are considerations before we look at the miracle that if my considerations are true, we can never get to the argument per se. That's right. I think now, those are a priori objections i tell my students there's a different there's a difference between an objection and a rejection rejections mm -hmm. are circular if you reject it on this i prior premise you are arguing in a circle mm -hmm. but if you set things up ahead of time and there are a lot of them that are re claim to be redoings of hume although hume never said that as far as we know fair enough sean's phrasing asking if historians can evaluate miracle claims is a consequence of the general question of whether testimony alone can ever be sufficient to establish a miracle. Here's Hume from the end of his part one on miracles. The plain consequence is, and it is a general maxim worthy of our attention, that no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. And even in that case, there is a mutual destruction of arguments, and the superior only gives us an assurance suitable to that degree of force, which remains after deducting the inferior. When anyone tells me that he saw a dead man restored to life, I immediately consider with myself whether it be more probable that this person should either deceive or be deceived, or that the fact which he relates should really have happened. I weigh the one miracle against the other, and according to the superiority, which I discover, I pronounce my decision and always reject the greater miracle. If the falsehood of his testimony would be more miraculous than the event which he relates, then, and not till then, can he pretend to command my belief or opinion. In other words, testimony alone is more likely to be lying or mistaken than describing an actual miracle. You have to handle the I priori ones, and that's what I do in the next chapter. I handle, well, in the second chapter, I'm not going to get into it. Sure. But in the second chapter, I handle 22 new takes on Hume, and I give almost 100 responses to those 22. All I'm saying is there are new takes and there are four times as many answers to the new takes. Promising that you have 100 responses in your book isn't particularly helpful here. No, but Sean is occasionally persistent. But one of the common sure. ones today is that history itself cannot consider the miraculous. Thus, history is not a tool that will even allow us to engage the resurrection. If this happened 2,000 years ago, you've cut the legs out on us. What's your response to that? Maybe one or two points how you would you would engage that idea. I I see that point, um, but here's where I would come back. I would say, at worst, you're saying historian doesn't have the tools to notice a theological argument because he's not a theologian. The historian, at worst, can't recognize this because he or she is not a philosopher. Admitting that a historian cannot establish a resurrection using the tools of history alone is to admit that Jesus' resurrection is not a historical question. The objection is that you're pretending that Christianity can be tested historically. 
but you're also admitting that it cannot. To your upcoming combo discipline rejoinder, I don't think a philosopher has the tools to establish that there's a resurrection either. And I don't think that a theologian has the tools to establish that there's a resurrection. Like it or not, most people put philosophy and theology into an entirely separate category of persuasiveness. That's why apologists like Gary and Sean like to put up the artifice of history because people's ears perk up when you say you have a historical argument. Let's just say that you have this data and you say, I'm not I'm not, I'm not trained to answer this. Well, then I'll ask this question. I'll say, but if you were, had a second PhD in philosophy or a second PhD in theology hmm. and your PhD in history, but if you knew that field, then could you respond to it? Oh yeah, yeah. And that's how they parse these disciplines. Deep down, you must know this is important for credibility. You've spent your life trying to put forth a historical case while also admitting that history alone cannot establish what you're trying to establish. If I say that I combine science and mythology to prove the existence of dragons, everyone sees that I'm not doing science, I'm doing mythology. The quote-unquote softer discipline sullies the harder discipline. I would still say you're not changing the data. It's almost irrelevant whether a secular historian can answer the question. It's almost irrelevant whether a secular historian can answer the question whether Jesus rose from the dead. Let that sink in, everyone. Tacit admission that this effort is not about trying to convince a skeptic, but merely to retain the faithful. I, I agree with you on that assessment. It's similar to the question intelligent design has to rest with. Is it science or not? Yes. Exactly, Sean. When someone like yourself or your guests admit that intelligent design isn't a scientific question, then most of the audience tunes out because theologians pointing to God with theological arguments is going to convince only a theist. Now, in the 19th century, the objections were less uh, kind of meta, as we might say, cutting out the legs. People were offering naturalistic hypotheses. Now, you point out in the book that these are much less popular today. But Indeed. So let's skip the objections I don't actually hold. But if you say the disciples stole the body, oh, are these the same guys who turned the world upside down, put their families on hold, uh, mm. James and John the fishermen, Peter the fisherman, ta uh, Matthew the tax collector, they put their life on hold to go out and they were totally transformed. I completely disagree with including Matthew on this list, but I'm willing to concede that Peter, James the brother of Jesus, and one of the Johns, probably son of Zebedee, were involved in the early church. But we don't have enough information about what they were like prior to claim transformed, but that's a quibble. And you're the man that did this research, but totally transformed. And as far as we know, you've got a comment like this in your Fate of the Apostles book. As far as we know, none of them ever recanted. Which is meaningful only if we can establish that they had a chance to recant, or if recanting would have been any benefit. For the three Gary is talking about, John is said to have died of old age, so no recanting necessary. James, the brother of Jesus, was killed in a political coup, so no amount of recanting would have helped him. And Peter was killed as part of a political cover-up where the emperor was blaming Christians for something he did. No amount of recanting would have helped because it wasn't ideologically motivated. It was for show. As Gary seems to be admitting, there's not enough evidence for any of the rest to even have this discussion or for the recanting point to be salient. And... Of, we don't we don't know that all the apostles died, but they were willing to die, and and people say to me, well, how can you say that? Can you read Paul's mind? Can you read Peter's mind? Can you read? I say, and I'll say no, but I can read their feet. And you go, well, what do you mean? Well, look, if I go into a city and get beat up, seriously beat up to preach the gospel because I care about people. To be clear, Gary can mean only Peter, James, and John here because I've been spending a lot of time of late reading all the ancient sources surrounding the lives of the Twelve and other than Peter, James, and John. There's no solid evidence that a single one of James, son of Zebedee, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, or Judas, son of James, preached even a single sermon, handed out a single tract, gave announcements at a single Sunday school meeting, affirmed a resurrection appearance, or ever said the name Jesus a single time after his death, let alone were traveling around and putting themselves in harm's way. Peter, 
James and John probably really believed it. Any of the rest, it's a giant nothing burger. These guys, of the ones we are sure of, you give just a few, the two Jameses and Peter and Paul. Okay, the James's son of Zebedee died too young to be a to be a player in this discussion. But James, the brother of Jesus, Paul and uh, Peter. Peter. You add John in there, who's there in Galatians chapter 2, but you get those first three. Nobody's been influ more influential in the church than those three. Peter, Paul, and James, the brother of Jesus. And we have first century sources for the martyrdom mm -hmm. of all three of them. I see you've quietly slipped Paul into the mix now. No matter. Paul was also killed under Nero, where recanting would do nothing to save him. And I'd affirm that Paul sincerely held his beliefs. Boy, Gary, it sure sounds like you're affirming the minimal witnesses hypothesis. But you haven't explained the appearances. That's great. And if you can't explain the appearances, you don't have a resurrection theory. You've got to deal with the appearances. Let's note for later that Gary can't say you have to deal with group appearances. He wants you to infer group appearances, but he can't say group appearances because they're not a minimal fact. Because you mm -hmm. hear a story that's really cool, it, you're going to say, I'm leaving my fishing business tomorrow, and I'm going to go... I'm going to convert the world even if I die for it. It's not the beginning of it. Ponenberg's point is you can't start the story with that. The story starts with guys, and, and everybody's unanimous on this, and the critics. You have to start the story with these guys thought they saw something. I agree, but how many people are these guys? Just like a chain of falling dominoes starts with just one, it explains your evidence sufficiently to say that one guy thought he saw something. Also notice that by saying they thought they saw something, Gary is affirming that being sincerely mistaken has the exact same end effect and impact as actually seeing something. Now let's shift yeah. to more modern objections that people might have. One of the big hypotheses, of course, Gerd Ludemann has talked about this in advance, this and debated William Lane Craig on this, is the hallucination hypothesis. Now hallucinations, just really quickly, of course, you know this, there's nothing objective like a UFO or an alien or you know another, maybe Bigfoot, some have said, these are internal projections of the mind. Yet this one seems to have some feet in the scholarly world, as far as I can tell. What would be your critique of the hallucination hypothesis? Maybe give us one or two that you think just are potentially devastating to it. Okay, first of all, definitions. So many people will say things like, hallucinations happen. I know they do. Well, like what? Because, well, one time I saw this, creature out in the woods and I thought it was the you know I thought it was Bigfoot but there was something there it turned out to be a bear and I just mm. misinterpreted it mm. but see my other the two hunters with me we all saw it so you can see things and you can see them in a group time time out you saw Bigfoot you thought and on closer inspection which is a key you found out it was a bear Okay. A hallucination is much more radical than that. Gary is awkwardly trying to differentiate between a hallucination and an illusion. According to the American Psychological Association's book on hallucinations, hallucination is a sensory experience which occurs in the absence of external stimulation of the relevant sensory organ, has a sufficient sense of reality to resemble a veridical perception, over which the subject does not feel she he has direct and voluntary control, and which occurs in the awake state. The important part is absence of external stimuli. An illusion is a misinterpretation of something perceived by the senses, which could theoretically be corrected by the percipient. This would include most magic tricks, for example, or optical illusions. A hallucination is not dependent on any vertical sensory object. To be charitable, Gary does clarify this later in the interview. A lot of times when people say, I can prove their group hallucinations, I saw one and give that bear example and thinking it's Bigfoot. That is not an hallucination, it's an illusion. But we're not talking about an illusion hypothesis at this point in the conversation. An hallucination is when you, you it's like you're looking at thin air. Here's an hallucination. I'm lecturing to my class and I turn and I say, honey, 
what are you doing here? And I begin talking to my mm. wife who died in 1995. And I say, she's in the classroom with me and I'm dead serious. And the students are looking around and someone's calling the campus police and wondering what's going on. That's more radical. It's not seeing the bear and thinking it's Bigfoot. It's looking at thin space mm. and coming up with an interpretation that everybody shares. Correct. What if everybody in the room saw my deceased wife with me? Oh, that's different. That's way more complicated. It is more complicated. Do you have good evidence? Do you think this is in any way analogous? But I'll give people probably the, maybe the toughest, I'll give the toughest obje objection. Somehow I doubt that. Here's Anthony Flew. Um, okay, my theory is, Flew talking, my theory is the disciples saw hallucinations. And the Christian is all revved up and ready to go. And they've got five refutations that they were taught in church and already. And they go, you can't say that because of A, B, C, D. And Flew says, hmm, what, what's your main critique? There are no such things as group hallucinations. And Flew comes back, my friend, there are no such thing as resurrections. Mm. Now, which one is more believable? The people in class, as crazy it is, could have seen mm. my wife standing up in front. That's crazy. But a resurrection is more crazy. There's no example. There's no other example of somebody coming back in a resurrected body. Lazarus doesn't count. Elijah doesn't count. Eli uh, Jesus is three. They, they don't count. And it's called the natural miracle objection. And he says, well, resurrections are impossible. Okay, so if I can trust your recollection of this conversation, see my video called the Resurrection Skeptics Have a Double Standard, where we compare Gary's recollection of his live debate with Flew compared to the actual recording of the debate to see the legendary development in Gary's own anecdotes. Flew is saying that his argument wins the day, even if he grants group hallucination, and I tend to agree. But Flew's mistake is in granting group hallucinations in the first place, even if for the sake of discussion. We don't have good evidence for group hallucinations. We have stories of alleged group appearances, but we have no reliable testimony of group appearances themselves. Not a single first-hand report, let alone corroborating first-hand reports. There are more group resurrection reports in the New Testament easily, more groups than individuals. Most of the mm. appearance reports are group. That's an argument from numbers, which isn't how we determine truth. There are far more Gospels written in the second century than in the first century. Should I suddenly prefer those to the canonical four because of sheer numbers? No, we evaluate group appearances with the criteria we use for any historical claim. Authenticity, immediacy, authorship status, intentionality, bias, corroboration, adornments, and plausibility. And by these criteria, I don't accept group appearances, and nor do enough scholars for you to make group appearances one of your minimal facts. When you claim group appearances, you're arguing outside of facts. And, I, and so I thought about this for a while, and I said, I didn't have to say it. I, this is what I would have said, but he never brought it up. Okay. So what follows is Gary's hypothetical debate about hallucinations that never actually happened outside of Gary's head. I said, Tony, consider something. The natural resurrection objection doesn't work here. Why not? Gary is imagining that Anthony would say, why not? Why not? Because there were multiple group appearances. In 1 Corinthians 15, the earliest creed, the most respected text in the New Testament, you have three group appearances, the 12, 500, and all the apostles. The creed also says that Jesus was raised on the third day. Guess what, Gary? Neither Anthony Flew nor I think that Jesus was raised on the third day. If I doubt the start of the passage, why am I suddenly going to believe the end of the passage? particularly when the end of the passage seems specifically constructed merely to lend validity to the start. Telling me that a creed said it is no different than telling me that the king's horses couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. We don't have a single first-hand report from anyone saying they were part of the group who saw Jesus. Not a single one of the 12, not a single one of the 500. None. And this isn't just the skepticism of some random blogger and YouTuber you can conveniently ignore. If there was enough support from scholars to say that group appearances were a fact, 
then Gary would have made group appearances one of his facts. This is merely secondary conjecture, and no one should buy it. Convenient that Gary brings this up to Anthony, only in a hypothetical conversation, after Anthony is dead. I said, Tony, you can't do it like that. Here's your objection. You have to defend a, not a group hallucination theory, you have to defend a group hallucination, group hallucination, group hallucination, mm. group hallucination, group hallucination theory. For those interested, I actually had a lengthy written debate on group appearances with Dr. Andrew Loke, which you can read on my blog or listen to on my live YouTube channel. They don't have it. Gary knows they don't have it, or it would be one of his facts. Group appearances are no more an accepted fact than Jesus walking on water is an accepted fact. It's an entirely uncorroborated element in a story. And, by the way, none of the multiple group appearance accounts actually corroborate each other. It's like each one is post hoc trying to flesh out the vague skeleton outline of Gary's favorite creed. Just like legends about young Jesus in infancy gospels later sprung up to fill in details about Jesus' life. Defend group appearances as a fact, Gary. Or you've got nothing at all here other than for the Bible tells me so. Now what's more likely? And he might say, I don't know. I still think a resurrection is less likely. What else is he going to say? He could say, as I have, demonstrate that there were group appearances. I'm saying, Tony, here's your problem. You're a naturalist. You don't have God in your system. A lot of people, Alvin Plantinga, Richard Swinburne, there are a lot of smart people who think God's there with good reasons. If God is in your system, you lost everything. You have not. I could absolutely believe in a God who created the universe and who actively does miracles every day and still acknowledge that all we have for Jesus' resurrection is testimony and understand that testimony alone isn't enough to establish the miracle. There are billions of humans who believe in God while also doubting Jesus rose from the dead. It's not just stubborn naturalists. I think one of the biggest comebacks is one sighting, one isn't going to do it. Why? What prevents a single individual from being sincerely mistaken and then convincing others? Virtually every Christian in history became one without personally seeing resurrected Jesus, including all the converts in the book of Acts. What exactly is implausible about the converts before Acts coming to believe in exactly the same way? No one has ever provided a good answer to this, and I'm not optimistic that Gary's new book will do it either. Prove me wrong, Gary. That's just one of the comebacks. But I can, I can argue other things. Refutations of hallucinations happen when something extraneous occurs. Let's go back to my wife. And the class thinks they see my wife in the room. What if people say, I don't know what's going on here, but um, can we ask her if she can do something? Like what? Um, take my book and throw it on the floor. And she takes mm. the book and throws it on the floor. And somebody's got their camera going, so they've got this on film. Wait, does someone have film of Risen Jesus? If not, your analogy is no longer useful. So there's other backups, and you have that kind of backup in the historical text. There's What backups do you have? Do you think that one of the legends of Jesus features the character of Jesus eating breakfast means that you provided something more substantive than mere hearsay testimony? You have not. And one of the things I, I want I, people I, watching to, to know that you do when you approach this is you take certain facts and say these yeah. hypotheses have to explain the facts. So the stolen body theory at best could explain the empty tomb, but not the appearances. Yeah. A reminder that the empty tomb is not one of Gary's facts. The hallucination, yeah. at best, could explain the appearances, but not the but empty not, tomb. Again, neither group appearances nor the empty tomb are in the list of facts to be explained. So I don't know what this has to do with anything. The empty tomb, Paul and James, are three kind of stand-up refutations that work with almost anything. Empty tomb is not a fact. Paul and James are latecomers who believed. No differently than Gary and Sean are latecomers who believed. Uh, I want to push this guy a little bit. What do you think happened with these facts? Well, I don't think I'm prepared to say that. I'm prepared. I have my whole minimal facts playlist you can watch today. And I'm slowly working on my own magnum opus. I don't think there's any empirical evidence for the truth of naturalism or materialism. I don't think you can prove it. So wait a minute. Let's say you're the skeptic. This whole interview, you've been going, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? And I'll say, on what grounds do you do that? 
oh, well, I'm a materialist. I'm a naturalist. I'm an atheistic evolutionist. Great. Let me just stop. Time out. What is the empirical position for your, what is empirical data for your position? And you're going to refute data on my part and sit there smugly without position that is, without data which establish your position. Ultimately, naturalism aligns with the principle of parsimony. It's an Occam's razor argument, which states that one should not multiply entities beyond necessity. Since naturalism requires only natural entities and processes to explain the universe that we agree exists, it's simpler and more parsimonious than worldviews that posit additional supernatural entities. Until such time as the supernatural is reliably demonstrated, methodological naturalism is the most reasonable default position. If naturalism is an assertion that everybody likes who wants to be free, who wants to have sexual freedom, wants to have political freedom, wants to have cheat in business, uh, get the government off their back, whatever. Gary, I was a fully committed Christian who wanted nothing more than to build up my faith. My search wasn't driven by a desire for sexual freedom or political freedom or any desire to sin. My search and my conclusion were driven entirely by intellectual honesty. This ascribing motive is not an argument. I'd say it's a feeble excuse to dismiss those who disagree with you, but that would be ascribing motive, which isn't helpful. I switch gears when I'm when I'm debating. So I'll stop and I'll go time out. Let's talk about NDs. And I won't tell you who it, who it is, but I was debating one time with probably the best known or close to the best known. There's a, two or three of them. Close to the best known atheistic guy against Christianity. I mean, not trained. I mean, not not a New Testament scholar. Why are you playing coy? You're talking about Anthony Flew again. You haven't done so many debates that we can't just look them up and see what you're talking about. Note that this is also the debate that Gary so badly misremembered in that previous video I mentioned. So let's see how Gary does at accurately representing it this time. And we were debating, and I, he said, tell me something about the world that should make me open to the resurrection. And I said, okay, something about the world. Yeah, yeah. Near-death experiences. Not a big deal, but absolutely not true. You were on the John Ankerberg show, and there was a commercial break, and then coming out of the commercial, it was host John who asked you this question, not Anthony. What we want to talk about in this section is a question that comes up time and time again, and that is, hey, my mom, my uh, sisters, my family members, my friends, uh, they might want to, Tony, believe in the resurrection, but doggone it, we don't see resurrections happening every day. Okay? All the funerals I've ever gone to, Dr. Habermas, I have yet to see any of those guys come back out of the grave. So my experience, all of my experience says, dead men stay dead, and you want to take me from ground zero here of saying, you know, dead men stay dead, all the way up to a miracle, not just a little tiny miracle, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And I've got no experience, no background on that, baby. Now help me out. Well, that's good. I mean, I think you've just explained well the, the issue that philosophers call antecedent probability. And I would guess that it's probably the, the single biggest issue on the miracles, not, not resurrection, but miracles issue. I, I think there's two ways a theist could go after this. One is to say, your view of the world is wrong. It's not that we're here and the resurrection is Mount Everest. The, this world here needs to be adjusted. Now, this isn't a debate on, on some of these other things, but if this were an extended debate and I would say, well, well what's our world look like? I would want to talk about data for God's existence. I would want to talk about near-death experiences. And because, see, if God exists, the playing field rises up quite a bit, or some would say like this. Hmm. If there's an afterlife, Jesus' resurrection is more likely. You know what the guy said to me? It's on tape. You know what the guy said to me? I don't want to talk about near-death experiences. He absolutely did not say this. As you say, it's on tape. You rambled about MDEs for 20 minutes. And here's the extent of Anthony's responses to the painfully overextended NDE discussion. But if there's life after death, it allows us to understand a model for what we call resurrection. Tony? 
Um, this is supposed to show life after death, isn't well, it? Well, I think, it, okay, not extenuated life, not heaven, hell, hours of death would be tough for a naturalist. Tony, does that open up the door in terms of the possibility of uh, more than naturalism? Hmm. Uh, not really, I think, but this is a, um, a, another summit. It's one of my favorite subjects, actually. Um, uh, I've written a lot of the literature about uh, what would you the possibility of a future life. What would you say happened in terms of those cases, then, to naturalistically? Somebody that can report something uh, miles away when they have no heart or brain activity. I mean, this, this is the sort of thing that's... Uh, um, Normally called out of the body experiences, isn't it? Except in an OBE, the person's not anywhere close to death. In an NDE, no, in an NDE, they're close mm -hmm. to death. In the case of this lady from uh, Alabama, I think, uh, or Georgia, uh, she's post-death by all accepted standards. You know, 59 degrees, blood, no blood in the head, no mm -hmm. heart, no brain for hours. Uh, she shouldn't be reporting anything, should she? Uh, no. Uh, but if she was really <laughs> dead, uh, she shouldn't be um, uh, recovering in this way. This is intriguing evidence for somebody who has no brain activity. She was on a lung machine. Yeah. By the way, her doctor gave her a 10% chance of living and a 1 in 10,000 chance of living with all her faculties. Three days later, she comes to spontaneously and says, You're the guy that resuscitated me. Where's the tall guy without the beard? He said, I'll get him for you. Now, this guy's an agnostic, and I've talked to the doctor myself. Guess what? He's no longer an agnostic. He's a theist. He's not a Christian, yeah. but he's a theist. <laughs> yeah. So, it's evidence yeah. for something. Uh, yes, I mean, this is the sort of thing that um, uh, societies for psychical research, or um, nowadays it's called parapsychology, investigate. And it seems to me one begins to start talking about, um, uh, not psychokinesis, extrasensory perception and so on. But you don't, in believe, in, you don't believe in ESP? Um, no. Okay, uh, so, what I, a, I, so what does a naturalist do with reports from miles away when there's no brain and heart activity? Um, I don't know about this one. I know um, uh, what to do with um, uh, most ESP reports because uh, basically uh, people again and again uh, try to establish evidence for this and the only way that will be demonstrate this is a repeatable demonstration. But of course all these people have functioning brains and hearts. Oh yeah, yeah. And this so is again, a person with angle. no brain and heart, this is, oh, no. uh, this this is, is quite th extraordinary. This is a new one to me, yes. Okay, well. Um, th this is certainly a new one. All right, we have to wrap this up. Gary, none of this matches Gary's claim that Anthony said he didn't want to talk about NDEs. And I said to him, I guess you don't. Because if you concede near-death experiences, you are going down a one-way trip to admitting the resurrection. And I said, and I said, uh, if you allow the resurrection, if you allow near-death experiences, and there's an afterlife which you don't believe in, if, if you are going to allow near-death experiences, you have to be more open to the resurrection data. And he said, well, all right, if I were to allow near-death experiences, I'd have to be more open to the resurrection. I already played the clips. Anthony said nothing remotely like this. He made no such concession whatsoever. Anthony said merely, this is a new one to me. It's on tape. And just at that time, just slightly afterwards, the moderator said, and that's all the time we have today, and I would... <laughs> this part is true. That's how I know it's the correct debate. Uh, this, this is, is quite this, extraordinary. This is a new one to me, yes. Okay, well... Um, th this is certainly a new one. All right, we have to wrap this up. Gary? Gary, for a guy whose career is essentially resting on the reliability of testimony, I'd suggest you stop giving testimony about events that can be fact-checked. Myself, <laughs> internally, I went like this. Yes, because the guy the guy had just got done saying, if there's that life after death, I'd have to be more open to the resurrection. You're undermining your case. I just played the tape. None of that happened. Please tell me again about how you accept things based on eyewitness testimony. Now, we're brushing up on time. You told me you were working on volume four for this, so I don't want to keep you any longer than necessary. But do you have a sense of where it, resurrection studies are headed and or where like kind of specifically objections to the resurrection are headed? What themes have you seen recently? 
And if you had to guess where they're moving, what would you maybe guess? Minimal witnesses hypothesis? I think today, Sean, we're moving toward an age that's going to open up. And I think we already see signs that naturalism is losing ground very quickly. Citation needed. Naturalism remains the dominant paradigm in science and much of academia. Methodological naturalism, which rejects supernatural explanations, is still widely considered the foundation for scientific and historical inquiry. Among mainstream scholarship, alternative philosophies remain minority positions. I think that's a major trend. We're getting away from the naturalistic theories. Uh, with Ludeman and John Shelby Spong dying, um, some, of, some of the critics have changed. Some of them have changed from their naturalistic theory to a more am amorphous view. And you can, I might, have, I might have given examples in that chapter, in the uh, agnostic chapter. But I think we're, I think we got to be ready for them because they could come any time. I'm working on it. I think the reason people don't want to take the theory is this. If I pick one theory and I'm willing to die with it. A guy actually told me this in a debate one time. Mm. He said, well, you're an atheist. I am. Pick a theory. He said, I'm not going to. I said, why not? Pick a theory. He goes, no. And I said, why? And he literally said, if I pick a theory and you give me arguments against it, <laughs> you will paint me in a corner and I won't be able to get out. I said, well, isn't that what I'm supposed to do? I'm the supernaturalist. You're the naturalist. Aren't you supposed to do that? For the record, I don't believe for a second that this happened. He used to attribute this to Bart Ehrman, but I've asked Bart about it. And Bart does put forth a view similar to mine. So now Gary's attributing it to yet another anonymous debater that we can't fact check. The problem is they don't pick one because if it gets slammed, they don't have a leg to stand on and they look silly before the audience. I put forth one, still waiting to be made to look silly, but you won't be addressing me due to scope and or genetic fallacy, depending on your view. All right, final question. Give us a quick update of when maybe volume, so volume two comes out this fall. People can pre-order it right now. Comes out soon. I'm using it in my class in defense of the resurrection, my grad class at Talbot Biola. We're using both the volumes. Uh, when is three coming out and when do you think volume four will come out? Volume two, September 15th, and about exactly, what is that, one month ago yesterday. Volume two, oh, and they tell me if the books aren't in the warehouse, they're going to be there very quickly. They're on target for a September 15th release. Volume three is due out May 15th, 2025. Okay. Volume three. That's fast. Volume four that I'm doing now, I, my due date's November 1st, 2024. They're saying volume four will hopefully be out on November 1st, 2025, one year later. Wow, that's fast. That is like 15 months this whole thing will be out and done. Isn't that amazing? I doubt I'll be done that quickly, particularly because Gary's giant books keep coming out and I need to go through them. Did you say you required volumes one and two for your class? Oh, wait a minute, they can't get volume two. So what do they do? Well, they'll get volume two in September. And then we'll just assign okay. it through the rest of the semester. So it better come but out I mean, or I'm in trouble. <laughs> all right. So you, you're you going to, I mean, money-wise, you're going to require volumes one and two for students to buy for class? I had the same reaction. In Canada, these books are around $100 each volume. So. Boy, that's amazing. I, I've never heard, I haven't heard any, somebody asked me last night, does, has anybody required this for one of their classes? And I said, I'm pretty sure Sean told me he's requiring volume one. I, now I can say, that was months ago. I say, now, yeah, Sean's going to require volume one and volume two. Was it someone who asked you last night? Or was it somebody who asked you months ago? Which is it? I want to be charitable for what happens in a live conversation. Because I'm not great at it myself. But come on. How am I supposed to believe Gary's quippy anecdotes at this point? As I said, Gary's credibility has nothing to do with the viability of his arguments. But every interview, he's demonstrating the unreliability of testimony, which is the thing upon which his entire resurrection case rests. I'm doing You're volume You're doing a two. real service here, man. Now, I am also require Fate of the Apostles, but I have a 10-year update coming out in, in spring. Are you kidding me? I just finished over a month of work looking up every resource in that book and recreating the work from scratch for myself. And now there's an update coming? Ugh. And I won't answer this right now. You and I can talk later. But five of the apostles I've just slightly reassessed 
in terms of the past decade of studying this and getting support and critique. And I think we've really landed on where the historical evidence points. I think the argument's stronger than ever, but I think we need to nuance a few things. That's a conversation down the road. You and I can have that one, but for right. now. But are, you, uh, are, you, are, you nuancing, are you nuancing it up or down? Is I'm the gonna, case looking better? I'm going to hold off on answering I, that question yet. I mean, Sean already tipped his hand on this in an interview. And there's a few things I've changed my mind. Number one, I probably would assess James, the son of Zebedee, one notch down. And that's mm -hmm. because we have one good source for James in the book of Acts. But I probably put that a little higher than it should be given one source. That's one I would revisit. And I fully agree. When Acts is a person's only source, one should lower confidence. I think one, I slightly notch down and two of them I completely shift. Now, with that said, I think uh, the four that you mentioned still died as martyrs. I don't shift there. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at that until we release this stuff as it gets closer. But the core of the if, argument if keep, is there. So. If you're going to keep the top four... See, even if you abandon ship and say, I got to drop one of those, I, you could, everybody can say there are first century sources for the deaths of the two James, uh, Peter and Paul. First century accounts of their death within the first century. Mm. That's pretty darn early for ancient texts. Yes. Well, we talked about it already in this video, but the martyrdoms of Peter, James, the brother of Jesus and Paul are baked into the minimal witnesses already. If John is the other member of the top four, then he wasn't murdered. And that's also baked in. Well, maybe what we'll do when this comes out, I'll send it to you and you can like flip the script here and interview me, cross-examine me like I did. And we'll have that conversation. It would be fun. Can't wait. But more reading in my future. And I'm still waiting for Gary's volume two to hit my doorstep. We will have you back if you're willing to come to talk about three, talk about four. And then maybe when it's all said and done, we'll just do a long Q&A where people can bring their toughest objections from your entire volume. And we'll go live and we'll address those together. That would be fun. Somehow I doubt that you'll let the public bring their toughest objections. But that would be fun. For more fun from a former Christian taking a look at the claims of Christians, tap on the video on screen now, and I'll see you over there. Until next time, later.